Chapter 2. Discovering the Success Mechanism Within You It may seem strange, but it is nevertheless true that up until 10 years ago, scientists had no idea of just how the human brain and nervous system worked purposely or to achieve a goal. They knew what happened from having made long and meticulous observations, but no single theory of underlying principles tied all these phenomena together into a concept that made sense. R. W. Gerard, writing in Scientific Monthly in June 1946 on the brain and imagination, stated that it was sad but true that most of our understanding of the mind would remain as valid and useful if, for all we knew, the cranium were stuffed with cotton wadding. <laughs> However, when man himself set out to build an electronic brain and to construct goal-striving mechanisms of his own, he had to discover and utilize certain basic principles. Having discovered them, these scientists began to ask themselves, could this be the way that the human brain works also? Could it be that in making man, our creator provided us with servo mechanism, more marvelous and wonderful than any electronic brain or guidance system ever dreamed of by man, but operating according to the same basic principles? In the opinion of a famous cybernetic scientist like Dr. Norbert Weiner, Dr. John von Neumann, and others, the answer was an unqualified yes. Every living thing has a built-in guidance system, a goal-striving device, put there by its creator to help it achieve its goal, which is, in broad terms, to live. In the simpler forms of life, the goal to live simply means physical survival for both the individual and the species. The built-in mechanism in animals is limited to finding food and shelter, avoiding or overcoming enemies and hazards, and procreation to ensure the survival of the species. In man, the goal to live means more than mere survival. For an animal to live simply means that certain physical needs must be met. Man has certain emotional and spiritual needs which animals do not have. Consequently, for man, to live encompasses more than physical survival and procreation of the species. It requires certain emotional and spiritual satisfactions as well. Man's built-in success mechanism also in, is much broader in scope than in animals. <clears throat> in addition to helping man avoid or overcome danger and the sexual instinct which helps keep the race alive, the success mechanism in man can help him get, his, get answers to problems, invent, write poetry, run a business, sell merchandise, explore new horizons in science, attain more peace of mind, develop a better personality, or achieve success in any other activity which is intimately tied into his living or makes for a fuller life. A squirrel does not have to be taught how to gather nuts, nor does it need to learn that it should store them for winter. A squirrel born in the spring has never experienced winter, yet in the fall of the year it can be observed busily storing nuts to be eaten during the winter months, when there will be no food to be gathered. A bird does not need to take lessons in nest building, nor does it need to take courses in navigation, yet birds do navigate thousands of miles, sometimes over open sea. They have no newspapers or TV to give them weather reports, no books written by explorer or pioneer birds to map out for them the warm areas of the earth. Nonetheless, the bird knows when cold weather is imminent in the exact location of a warm climate, even though it may be thousands of miles away. In attempting to explain such things, we usually say that animals have certain instincts which guide them. Analyze all such instincts and you will find that they assist the animal to successfully cope with its environment. In short, animals have a success instinct. We often overlook the fact that man too has a success instinct, much more marvelous, much more com complex than, any of that, than that of any animal. Our creator did not shortchange man. On the other hand, man was exceptionally blessed in this regard. Animals cannot select their goals. Their goals, self-preservation and procreation, are preset, so to speak, and their success mechanism is limited to these built-in goal images, which we call instincts. Man, on the other hand, has something animals haven't, which is creative imagination. Thus, man of all creature, creatures is more than a creature. He's also a creator. With his imagination, he can formulate a variety of goals. Man alone can direct his success mechanism by the use of imagination or imaging ability. We often think of creative imagination as applying only to poets, inventors, and the like, but imagination is creative in everything we do. Although they did not understand why or how imagination sets our creative mechanism into action, Serious thinkers of all ages, as well as hard-headed practical men, have recognized the fact and made use of it. Imagination rules the world, said Napoleon. Imagination of all man's faculties is the most godlike, said Glenn Clark.
the faculty of imagination is the great spring of human activity and the principal source of human improvement. Destroy this faculty, and the condition of man will become as stationary as that of the brutes, said Dugald Stewart, the famous, famous Scottish philosopher. You can imagine your future, says Henry Kaiser, who attributes much of his success in business to the constructive, positive use of creative imagination. How your success mechanism works. You are not a machine. But new discoveries in the science of cybernetics all point to the conclusion that your physical brain and nervous system make up a servo mechanism, which you use, and which operates very much like an electronic computer and a mechanical goal-seeking device. Your brain and nervous system constitute a goal-striving mechanism which operates automatically to achieve a certain goal, very much as a self-aiming torpedo or missile seeks out its target and steers its way to it. Your built-in servo mechanism functions both as a guidance system to automatically steer you in the right direction to achieve certain goals or make correct responses to environment, is also, and also as an electronic brain, which can function automatically to solve problems, give you your needed answers, and provide new ideas or inspirations. In his book, The Computer and the Brain, Dr. John von Neumann says that the human brain possesses the attributes of both the analog and the digital, digital computer. The word cybernetics comes from a Greek word which means literally the steersman. Servo mechanisms are so constructed that they automatically steer their way to a goal, target, or answer. Psycho-cybernetics, a new concept of how your brain works. When we conceive of the human brain and nervous system as a form of servo mechanism operating in accordance with cybernetic principles, we gain a new insight into the why and wherefore of human behavior. I choose to call this new concept psycho Psycho-cybernetics, the principles of cybernetics, is applied to the human brain. I must repeat, psycho-cybernetics does not say that man is a machine. Rather, it says that man has a machine, which he uses. Let us examine some of the similarities between mechanical servo mechanisms and the human brain. The two general types of servo mechanisms. Servo mechanisms are divided into two general types. One, where the target, goal, or answer is known, and the objective is to reach it or accomplish it and two, where the target or answer is not known and the objective is to discover or locate it. The human brain and nervous system operates in both ways. An example of the first type is the self-guided torpedo, or the interceptor missile. The target or goal is known, an enemy ship or plane. The objective is to reach it. Such machines must know the target they are shooting for. They must have some sort of propulsion system, which propels them forward in the general direction of the target. They must be equipped with sense organs, radar, sonar, heat receptors, etc., which bring information from the target. These sense organs keep the machine informed when it is on the correct course, which is positive feedback. When it commits an error and gets off course, negative feedback. The machine does not react or respond to positive feedback. It's doing the correct thing already, and it just keeps on doing what it's doing. There must be a corrective device, however, which will respond to negative feedback. When negative feedback informs the mechanism that it's off the beam too far to the right, the corrective mechanism automatically causes the rudder to move so that it will steer the machine back to the left. If it overcorrects, heads too far to the left, this mistake is made known through negative feedback, and the corrective device moves the rudder so that it will steer the machine back to the right. The torpedo accomplishes its goal by going forward, making errors, and continually correcting them. By a series of zigzags, it literally gropes its way to the goal. Dr. Norbert Weiner, who pioneered in the development of goal-seeking mechanisms in World War II, believes that something very similar to the, f to the foregoing happens in the human nervous system whenever you perform any purposeful activity, even in such a simple goal-seeking situation as picking up a pack of package of cigarettes from a table. We are able to accomplish the goal of picking up the cigarettes because of an automatic mechanism, and not by will and forebrain thinking alone. All that the forebrain does is select the goal trigger into action by desire and feed information to the automatic, automatic mechanism so that your hand continually corrects its course. In the first place, said Dr. Weiner, only an autonomous anatomist I'm sorry, would know all the muscles involved in picking up the cigarettes. If you knew you would not con if you knew and if you knew you would not consciously say to yourself, I must contract my shoulder muscles to elevate my arm. Now I must contract my triceps to extend my arm, etc. You just go ahead and pick up the cigarettes and are not conscious of issuing orders to individual muscles, nor of computing just how much contra uh, contraction is needed. When you select the goal and trigger, and trigger it into action, an automatic mechanism takes over. First of all, you have picked up cigarettes or performed similar movements before. Your automatic mechanism has learned something of the correct response needed. Next, your automatic mechanism uses feedback data furnished to the brain by your eyes, which tells it the degree to which the cigarettes are not picked up. 
This feedback data enables the automatic mechanism to continually correct the motion of your hand until it's steered to the cigarettes. In a baby, just learning to use its muscles, the correction of the hand in reaching for a rattle is very obvious. The baby has little, has little stored information to draw upon. It, its hand zigzags back and forth and gropes obviously as it reaches. It is characteristic of all learning that as learning takes place, correction becomes more and more diff refined. We see this in a person just learning to drive a car who overcorrects and zigzags back and forth across the street. Once, however, a correct or successful response has been accomplished, it is remembered for future use. The automatic mechanism that duplicates the successful response on future trials. It has learned how to respond successfully. It remembers its successes, forgets its failures, repeats the successful action without any further conscious thought or as a habit. Now let us suppose that the room is dark so that you cannot see the cigarettes. You know or hope there's a package of cigarettes on the table along with a variety of other objects. Instinctively, your hand will begin to grope back and forth, performing zigzag motions or scanning, rejecting one object after another until the cigarettes are found and recognized. This, an ex this is an example of the second type of servo mechanism. Recalling a name temporarily forgotten is another example. A scanner in your brain scans back through your stored memories until the correct name is recognized. An electronic brain solves problems in much the same way. First of all, a great deal of data must be fed into the machine. The stored or recorded information is the machine's memory. A problem is posed to the machine. It scans back through its memory until it locates the only answer which is consistent with and meets all the conditions of the problem. Problem and answer together constitute a whole situation or structure. When part of the situation or structure, the problem, is given to the machine, it locates the only missing parts or the right size brick, so to speak, to complete the structure. The more that is learned about the human brain, the more closely it resembles, insofar as function is concerned, a servo mechanism. For example, Dr. Wilder Penfield, director of the Montreal Neurological Institute, recently reported at a meeting of the National Academy of Sciences that he had discovered a recording mechanism in a small area of the brain which apparently records everything that a person has ever experienced, observed, or learned. During a brain op operation in which the patient was fully awake, Dr. Penfield happened to touch a small area of the cortex with a surgical instrument. At once, the patient exclaimed that she was reliving an incident from her childhood, which she had consciously forgotten. Further experiments along this line brought the same results. When certain areas of the cortex were touched, patients did not merely remember past experiences, they relived them, experiencing it as very real, all the sights, sounds, sensations of the original experience. It was just as if past experiences had been recorded on a tape recorder and played back. Just how a mechanism as small as the human brain can store such a vast amount of information is still a mystery. British neuro neurophysicist uh, W. Gray Walter has said that at least 10 billion electronic cells would be needed to build a fast mill of man's brain. These cells would occupy about a million and a half cubic feet, and several additional millions of cubic feet would be needed for the nerves or wiring. Power required to operate it would be 1 billion watts. We marvel at the awesomeness of interceptor missiles, which can compute in a flash the point of interception of another missile and be there at the correct instant to make contact. Yet, are we not witnessing something just as wonderful each time we see a center fielder catch a fly ball? In order to compute where the ball will fall or where the point of interception will be, he must take into account the speed of the ball, its curvature of fall, its direction, windage, initial velocity, and the rate of progressive decrease in velocity. He must make these computations so fast that he will be able to take off at the crack of the bat. Next, he must compute just how fast he must run and in what direction in order to arrive at the point of interception at the same time the ball does. The center fielder doesn't even think about this. His built-in goal-striving mechanism computes it for him from data, which he feeds it through his eyes and ears. The computer in this, his brain takes this information, compares it with stored data, memories of other successes and failures in catching fly balls. All necessary computations are made in a flash and orders are issued to his leg muscles, and he just runs. Dr. Weiner has said that at no time in the foreseeable future will scientists be able to construct an electronic brain anywhere near comparable to the human brain. I think that our gadget conscious public has shown an unawareness of the special advantages and special disadvantages of electronic machinery as compared with the human brain, he says. The number of switching devices in the human brain vastly exceeds the number in any computing machine yet developed or even thought of for the design in the near future. But even should such a machine be built, it would lack an operator. A computer does not have a forebrain, nor an eye. It cannot pose problems to itself. It has no imagination, cannot set goals for itself. It cannot determine which goals are worthwhile and which are not. It has no emotions, it cannot feel. 
It works only on new data fed to it by its, an operator, by feedback data and it secures from its own sense organs and from information previously stored. Many great thinkers of all ages have believed that man's stored information is not limited to his own memories, past experiences, and learned facts. There is one mind common to all individual men, said Emerson, who compared our individual minds to the inlets in an ocean of the universal mind. Edison believed that he had gotten some of his ideas from a source outside himself. Once, when complimented for a creative idea, he disclaimed credit, saying that ideas are in the air, and if he had not discovered it, someone else would have. Dr. J. B. Ryan, head of Duke University's Parapsychology Laboratory, has proved experimentally that man has access to knowledge, facts, and ideas other than his own individual memory or stored information from learning or experience. Telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition have been established by scientific laboratory experiments. His findings, that man possesses some extrasensory factor, which he calls psi, are no longer doubted by scientists who have seriously reviewed his work. As Professor R. H. Toulis of Cambridge University says, the reality of the phenomenon must be regarded as proved as certainly as anything in scientific research can be proved. We have found, said Dr. Ryan, that there is a capacity for acquiring knowledge that transcends the sensory functions. This extrasensory capacity can give us knowledge certainly of objective and very likely of subjective states, knowledge of matter and most probably of minds. Schubert is said to have told a friend that his own creative process consisted in remembering a melody that neither he nor anyone else had ever thought of before. Many creative artists, as well as psychologists who have, been a, who have made a study of the creative process, have been impressed by the similarity of creative inspiration, sudden revelation, intuition, etc., in ordinary human memory. Searching for a new idea or an answer to a problem is, in fact, very similar to searching memory for a name you have forgotten. You know that the name is there, or else you would not search. The scanner in your brain scans back over stored memories until the desired name is recognized or discovered. In much the same way, when we set out to find a new idea or the answer to a problem, we must assume that the answer already exists already somewhere and set out to find it. Dr. Norbert Weiner has said, once a scientist, a scientist attacks a problem which he knows to have an answer, his entire attitude has changed. He's already some 50% of his way toward that answer. When you set out to do creative work, whether in the field of selling, managing a business, writing a sonnet, improving human relations or whatever, you begin with the goal in mind and end to be achieved a target answer, which, although perhaps somewhat vague, will be recognized when achieved. If you really mean business, have an intense desire, and begin to think intensely about all the angles of the problem, your creative mechanism goes to work, and the scanner we spoke of earlier begins to scan back through stored information or grope its way to an answer. It selects an idea here, a fact there, a series of former experiences, and relates them or ties them together into a meaningful whole which will fill out the incompleted portion of your situation, complete your equation, or solve your problem. When the solution is served up to your consciousness, often at an unguarded moment when you are thinking of something else, or perhaps even as a dream while your consciousness is asleep, something clicks and you once, at once recognize this is the answer you've been searching for. In this process, does your creative mechanism also have access to stored information in a universal mind? Numerous experiences, uh, experiences of creative workers seem to indicate that it does. How else, for example, explain the experience of Louis, Louis Agassi, told by his wife? He had been striving to decipher the somewhat obscure impression of a fossil fish on the stone slab in which was it was preserved. Weary and perplexed, he put his mind his, his, his work aside at last and tried to dismiss it from his mind. Shortly after, he waked one night, persuaded that while asleep he had seen his fish with all the missing features perfectly restored. He went early to the Jardin de Plantes, thinking that on um, looking anew at the impression, he would see something to put him on the track of his vision. In vain, the blurred re record was as blank as ever. The next night, he saw the fish again, but when he waked, it disappeared from his memory as before. Hoping the same experience might be repeated, on the third night, he placed a pen pencil and paper before his bed before he go to sleep. He went to sleep. Towards morning, the fish reappeared in his dream, confusedly at first, but at last with such distinctive distinctiveness that he no longer had any doubt to its zoological characters. Still half dreaming in perfect darkness, he traced these characters on the sheet of paper at the bedside. In the morning, he was surprised to see in his nocturnal sketch features which he thought it impossible the fossil indeed would reveal. He hastened to the Jardin de, de Plante, and with his drawing as a guide, succeeded in chiseling away the surface of the stone under which portions of the fish proved to be hidden. When wholly exposed, the fossil corresponded with his dream and his drawing, and he succeeded in classifying it with ease. Practice ex ex exercise number one, get a new mental picture of yourself. The unhappy failure type personality cannot develop a new self-image by pure willpower or by arbitrarily deciding to. 
There must be some ground, some justification, some reason for deciding that the old picture of self is an error and that a new picture is appropriate. You cannot merely imagine a new self-image unless you feel that it is based upon truth. Experience has shown that when a person does change his self-image, he has the feeling that for one reason or another, he sees and realizes the, tr the truth about himself. The truth in this chapter can set you free of an old, inadequate self-image. If you read it often, think intently about the implications and hammer home its truths to yourself. Science has not confirmed what philosophers, mystics, and other intuitive people have long declared. Every human being has been literally engineered for success by his creator. Every human being has access to a power greater than himself. This means you. As Emerson has said, there are no great and no small. If you were engineered for success and happiness, then the old picture of yourself as unworthy of happiness of a person who is meant to fail must be an error. Read this chapter through at least three times per week for the first 21 days. Study it. Digest it. Look for examples in your experiences and the experiences of your friends which illustrate the creative mechanism in action. Memorize the following basic principles in which your success me mechanism operates. You do not need to be an electronic engineer or a physicist to operate your own servo mechanism. Any more than you have to be able to engineer an automobile in order to drive one, or become an electric engineer to turn on the light in your room. You do, you do need to be familiar with the following, however, because having memorized them, they will throw new light on what is to follow. 1. Your built-in success mechanism must have a goal or a target. This goal or target must be conceived of as already in existence, now, either in actual or potential form. It operates by either steering you to a goal already in existence, or by discovering something already in existence. Uh, two, the automatic mechanism is uh, teleological, that is, operates or must be oriented to end results, goals. Do not be discouraged because the means whereby may not be apparent. It is the function of the automatic mechanism to supply the means whereby when you supply the goal. Think in terms of the end result, and the means whereby will often take care of themselves. 3. Do not be afraid of making mistakes or of temporary failures. All servo mechanisms achieve a goal by negative feedback or by going forward, making mistakes, and immediately correcting course. 4. Skill learning of any kind is accomplished by trial and error, mentally correcting aim after an error until a successful motion, movement, or performance has been achieved. After that, further learning and continued success is accomplished by forgetting the past errors, remembering the successful response so that it can be initiated. Er, I'm sorry, can be imitated. 5. You must learn to trust your creative mechanism to do its work and not jam it by becoming too concerned or too anxious as to whether it will work or not, or by attempting to force it by too much conscious effort. You must let it work rather than make it work. This trust is necessary because your creative mechanism operates below the level of consciousness. You cannot know what's going on beneath the surface. Moreover, its nature is to operate spontaneously according to present need. Therefore, you have no guarantees in advance. It comes into operation as you act, and as you place a demand upon it by your actions. You must not wait to act until you approve. You must act as if it's there, and it will come through. Do the thing, do the thing and you will have the power, said Emerson.